human remains found in a San Francisco Bay Area canyon on Saturday are those of Michelle Lee, the missing nursing student who disappeared in May. Molly McLaren. 23 year old Molly McLaren from Kent in the UK was a warm, bubbly, and popular young woman. One of her friends said, If she became your friend, you were friends for life. Molly was in her second year at Kent University and studying health and fitness, which was her main passion in life. Having battled bulimia, she was determined to overcome her issues and take back control. She even launched a blog talking about her recovery and offering support to others going through the same thing. Her mother said that although outwardly she was confident and positive, inside she was still quite reserved and could often feel insecure. But this didn't stop her from throwing herself into her studies and she was on course to get a first class honours degree. In the summer of 2016, Molly joined the dating app Tinder and it was on this site that she started talking to 25-year-old Josh Stimpson. They spoke for around three months before meeting up in person and quickly began a relationship. Stimson was open about his battles with bipolar disorder and even ran a marathon to raise money and awareness for it. Molly saw him as someone she could help and hoped he would be there for her too. Although initially the relationship seemed to be going well, Molly's friends and family soon started to see a change in Molly and how happy she was. Josh had started becoming controlling and he eventually quit his job to spend more time with Molly. He started turning up at her house and invited and developed a problem with her spending time with other people. He started taking video recordings of her and tried to stop her being alone with her friends. This was a sign for Molly that she needed to spend more time on her studies and focus on herself. She decided she needed to end the relationship. While on an evening out with friends and with Josh exhibiting more controlling and emotionally abusive signs, she decided to break up with him. Although she said she felt guilty for doing this publicly, she also felt safe around her friends and in a public place to do this and knew it was the right time. Josh took the news badly and began a tirade of abuse on social media towards Molly and would tag her parents in posts. He accused her of taking drugs amongst many other things. He continued to send her obsessive and abusive messages and Molly texted a friend saying she was afraid of him. Her mother Jo decided enough was enough and took it to the police. At this point, with no criminal record, the police could only advise Molly to avoid all contact with him and keep track of everything. They did contact Josh, however, and told him if his behaviour persisted, they would be forced to arrest him. A few days later, Stinson joined the same gym where he knew Molly had applied to work and continued to bombard her with messages and calls. The police spoke to him for a second time. Around 5pm on June 27th, he bought a knife from an Asda in Chatham. He then bought a pickaxe from a nearby home base 24 minutes later. Things then went very quiet until Molly posted on Snapchat saying she was out for a meal and drinks with some friends. She thought nothing of this, as Stimson had been blocked on everything. While she was out, however, Stimson turned up, and Molly felt so violated and uncomfortable that she left early. The next day at around 10am, she headed for a morning workout at Pure Gym at the Dockside Retail Park in Chatham, but the atmosphere quickly changed. At 10.25, Stimson arrives outside the same gym. He momentarily turns around on the stairs, but comes back up and starts working out next to her. She sends messages to her friends and mother saying, he's just turned up. I feel like I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. Molly's mum Jo tells her to leave straight away and come home. 
She has a brief conversation with Stimson before he leaves, again pausing on the stairs for a moment before heading outside. Molly waits a few minutes to leave the gym herself. The events that transpire soon after are nothing short of horrific. Just after 11am, Molly McLaren got into her car in the car park of the gym, where she was ambushed and attacked by Stimson, who had been waiting for her. She was stabbed 75 times in a frenzied and brutal attack. In full view of the public, a passerby tried to save Molly by attempting to drag Stimson out of the car, but he was so covered in blood that the member of the public couldn't hold on to him to pull him out. When the police arrived, Stimson said, She's in the car. I've killed her. It turned out that Stimson had gotten someone to keep track of Molly on social media, and that's how he knew her whereabouts the whole time. Her friends and family would hear about it on the news. Her mother said the second she heard the story, although they didn't confirm the name, she knew instantly it was her daughter. On June 30th, 2017, Josh Stimson was charged with murder. He claimed diminished responsibility and said he couldn't remember anything about the attack. The trial was set for the 23rd of January 2018, and on the 6th of February, he was found guilty of the murder of Molly McLaren and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 26 years. Molly McLaren was 23, beautiful and intelligent. Her life full of promise ended by Joshua Stimson, the young man she met on a dating app whose response to their relationship breaking up was to plan her brutal murder. This was a narcissistic individual who was evil and should be locked up for a very long time and I think 26 years does reflect that fact. Her parents accepted her university degree posthumously and went on to set up the Molly McLaren Foundation. It aims to raise awareness of eating disorders and help with funding for charities who provide support to people suffering from it, a fitting tribute to Molly McLaren. Meta Valentine Meta Price Valentine was born on January 1st, 1971. She was a deeply spiritual woman and a loving and doting mother of three children. She regularly attended church and Bible study groups and was the secretary of the Deliverance Praise Church of Worship. She lived in the Sycamore Park Complex in Fayetteville, North Carolina. On October 29, 2014, Meta was reported missing by friends in her Bible study group. When the police began to look into it, they noted that on the evening of the 28th of October, Valentine's mother said she had received an odd call from her daughter. She said that she had been, quote, speaking in riddles. This was around 10.30pm and this was the last anyone is known to have spoken to her. Upon watching the CCTV footage from outside her complex, it showed that five hours before this call was made, she returned home. At around 5.30pm, she is seen walking back to her apartment from the complex front office. She pauses. She is then seen rushing into the apartment with someone getting out of a car and running in after her. This person would eventually be identified as her on-again, off-again boyfriend and father of one of her children, Reginald McDowell. Having been on and off since school, they had a rocky and tumultuous relationship. According to court documents, in 1999, McDowell kidnapped Valentine and her boyfriend, Kenneth D. Thompson. Thompson was bound and gagged and had been forced into the trunk of Valentine's car. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 2001 and was released early in 2011. McDowell and Valentine resumed their relationship when he was released. However, 11 days before she went missing, she had ended the relationship again. McDowell initially cooperated with the investigation regarding what had happened on the night of the 28th of October, but eventually stopped talking to the police. He moved out of the area and cut off all contact and communication with his relatives, including his own son. Valentine's pastor said that in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, she was scared of something or someone. She would ask people to walk her home from church and would often take different routes to remain under the radar. Foul play was suspected and in March 2018, McDowell was charged with first-degree murder and kidnapping, but unfortunately, no one could locate him. 
The district attorney said that due to probable cause, he's the only suspect in the case. And what her family really wants folks at home to know is she's a mother, she's a sister, she's an aunt, and she's a grandmother, and her family just wants her back. It is hard because, you know, I always wanted her there when I got married. I um, have my kids and stuff like that, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping it's still a chance that happen. If she could take care of you, she would try to. Um, she loved to eat, which is why I love to cook. Today, showing us the last Facebook message she sent him the day before she disappeared. It says, hello, my chipmunk. I love you very much. Your mother misses you. Police think he may have traveled to New York, but whenever and wherever he is found, he will be arrested and brought back to stand trial. He remains at large to this day and no trace of Meta Valentine has ever been found. If you have any information relating to the disappearance or whereabouts of Meta Valentine, then please contact the Fayetteville Police Department or Crime Stoppers. Tips can also be submitted anonymously online. Israel Keys Police believe that Israel Keyes' violent crime spree began around 1996 and only ended when he was caught in 2012. Born in Utah in 1978 into a large Mormon family, Keyes was one of ten children. He was homeschooled and would eventually consider himself a fundamentalist Christian. Between the ages of three and five, his family moved from Utah to Colville and lived in a one-bedroom cabin with no water or electricity. It was here his family met and became friends with a white supremacist and later convicted murderer called Chevy O'Brien Kehoe. In 1998, Keyes joined the US Army and served until he was discharged in 2001. He was said to have been quiet, although he would often drink heavily, consuming whole bottles of bourbon to himself. While he lived in Washington, Keyes admitted to murdering four people and killing another person in New York. He said once he started, there was nothing else like it. He also admitted to many bank robberies across Texas and New York and set someone's home on fire after robbing it. He said he killed a woman in New Jersey and also broke into a couple's home, sexually assaulting the woman and killing both of them. His final victim was 18-year-old Samantha Koenig. She worked at a coffee hut called Common Grounds in Anchorage, Alaska. On the 1st of February 2012, Israel Keyes entered the hut and ordered an Americano. When Samantha turned back around, he had a ski mask on and was pointing a gun at her. He orders her to turn off the lights and then gags her and forces her out of the coffee shop and into his car. He took her back to his house where he kept her in the shed for the rest of the day and subjected her to a horrific sexual assault and then killed her. He left her body in the shed for two weeks while he went on a family cruise. After the cruise was over, he committed more burglaries across Texas before returning to his home where he set a plan in motion which would lead the police straight to him. He took Samantha's body, applied makeup to her face and sewed her eyelids open with fishing wire before taking photographs of her holding a newspaper, asking for $30,000 in ransom. After this, he dismembered her and dumped her body in Matanuska Lake. In March, he flew to Las Vegas and hired a car to drive to Arizona. He used the disguise as he withdrew $400 from Samantha's account using her card. The security camera picked up the rental car. Just two days later, her debit card showed it was being used again in Texas. The police were already looking for the same car that had been spotted. On March 13th, a police officer spotted the car wanted in connection with Samantha's disappearance outside a motel. When Keyes left the motel, the officer followed him. In his car, he had Samantha's debit card, the disguises he had used at the ATM machines and a roll of money he had stolen from a bank. He was subsequently arrested and flown back to Alaska. It would be a while before Keyes admitted to anything. But when he finally agreed to talk, 
He said he would only tell them the details if they promised to not let anything slip to the press. He said he didn't want his daughter to read about it in the papers. If you think I want to be indicted or charged with any of these other crimes, then you're wrong. I mean, and you told us that, that we're trying to avoid that, right? We're right. To avoid, so, avoid I don't, control it, so I don't understand how giving information is going to... Well, let's just, let's just say, what, what happens if, um, if Vermont says, you know, we thought this guy was cooperating, what if, what if they were to say, we're going to charge him, so then you get charged in Vermont? Well, they're going to have to wait their turn, aren't they? As, or, I shouldn't say none of it. About half of what I thought we had an understanding on you know, from the very beginning, hasn't worked out in my favor. Granted, you know, some things haven't worked out in your favor, but I just think at this point, I just don't see what incentive I have to tell you anything else. I've got, I mean, day to day, I got day to day issues, and, you know, we come over here and we sit in this room and I still don't know what's going on with, like I say, with, with everything that we've talked about. Um, so talking about other crimes, um, uh, you know, we, we wanted to kind of pick up where we left off on some things, uh, give you any information that uh, you might be thinking about over the last few weeks right. um, related to that. And uh, I think we had some updates uh, on the New York search mm -hmm. and things like that. So uh, why, don't we, why don't we start there? Okay, and I and also the the live feed. I wanted yeah. to jump into that because I know um, we came over on Tuesday. Um, we had it set up. We had a couple guys up in Tupper Lake. Um, oh. <laughs> To, to go over the bank, to go over the bankrupt. Yeah, bit of that a drive. That was a three-hour drive. <laughs> where they were at. Um, now, in all fairness, I never set up a specific day, but it actually would have worked because my attorney didn't show up till that afternoon. Two months after she had last been seen, the police finally recovered Samantha's body. He eventually confessed to multiple horrific crimes while awaiting trial and said he chose the victims completely at random. The police believe there could be up to 11 victims, and possibly even more. On May 23rd, he appeared before a judge at a hearing to set a trial date. He broke free from his steel leg shackles and jumped into the first row of seats. Officers had to taser him. On December 2nd, 2012, Israel Keyes committed suicide by cutting his wrists and strangling himself. He left a suicide note that read, Ode to Murder, under his bed. He had drawn 11 skulls in blood. It is likely we will never know the full extent and story surrounding the victims of Israel Keyes, but investigators continue to follow up on leads and use Keyes' own confession to try and piece together as much as they can. Michelle Lee Michelle Lee was a 26-year-old nursing student from San Diego, California. Studying at Samuel Merritt University, she was working at the Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in the San Francisco Bay Area. She worked on the maternity ward, which she loved. Michelle was close to getting her degree in nursing and was excited for the future that lay ahead. Alongside nursing, she was also a part-time accountant and worked hard to balance everything. Her mother had also been a nurse but had tragically died of cancer in 1999 when Michelle was just 15. She took on the maternal role in her family looking after her younger brother and cousin. She never struggled to make friends and was a very popular young woman. Kind, caring, smart and hardworking, nursing was the perfect fit for her. May 27th, 2011, on a quiet Friday evening. Michelle was in the middle of a clinical training session. This was the final class she needed to complete in order to graduate and finishing this would complete her internship. She told the supervisor she quickly needed to head to her car to get some medication. Michelle never returned, and the instructor was deeply concerned. She headed out to the parking lot with a security guard to try and find her. She saw Michelle's white Honda drive away, and although the instructor called out after her, the car never came back. People at the hospital tried to contact her, but they only received text messages back. 
one of which said she was heading to Reno and wanted to be left alone, with only a day left of her internship and with graduation just a short while away. This made no sense to her classmates. Her purse, wallet and driver's licence were all still in the break room. The hospital security guard found blood on the floor of the parking lot where Michelle's car had been parked and it became apparent that something deeply sinister had happened. Fortunately, the police quickly located her car the following morning thanks to a theft and recovery tracker and it was parked half a mile away in a parking lot of an apartment complex. Inside the car was a lot of blood, and it was clear that Michelle didn't leave the hospital of her own accord. Police found a hospital ID badge in the car, but it wasn't Michelle's. It belonged to someone called Katie Miller. Katie had only just enrolled and was yet to start at the hospital. She was in Hawaii at the time of Michelle's disappearance. So who had stolen Katie's ID, and how had they done it? Her family and friends were baffled, and no one had any idea as to who would want to hurt Michelle. Michelle's best friend, Giselle Esteban, came forward and told police that she had seen Michelle that night at the hospital along the walkway. Giselle had gone through school with Michelle and had been hoping to study nursing alongside her until she fell pregnant and had a baby with her boyfriend, Scott. Unable to balance it all, Giselle dropped out of school and her and Michelle eventually started to drift apart. Giselle was at the hospital that night getting a scan as she revealed to police she was pregnant for a second time. She told the police that Scott and Michelle had been an item and the investigators needed to look more closely at him. There was a lot of CCTV around the hospital and if Scott was involved, the police felt certain he would have been picked up on camera somewhere. While they were checking the cameras, Scott was interviewed about what he said was a platonic and friendly relationship with Michelle. He appeared very open, honest and forthcoming. The cameras from the parking lot had hundreds of hours of footage across several cameras. At 6.55, the cameras picked up Michelle crossing the walkway, just as Esteban had said. Nothing appeared wrong or out of place. But the only camera pointing at her car wasn't connected properly and showed nothing. They finally see her car, but the driver cannot be made out. Inside the building and tracking where Katie's keycard had been scanned, they spot something. A woman is seen around the hospital in various locations, wearing a baseball cap covering her face. She is seen trying and failing to get into several rooms. She manages to get into one with Katie's keycard. She turns off the lights, grabs a lab coat and picks up some files. In this moment, they realise who it was. It was Giselle Esteban, Michelle's best friend. Giselle was brought in by police for formal questioning. She was standoffish with investigators and covered her face the whole time. The shoes that she had worn that day tested positive for Michelle's blood and Giselle's hair was also found in Michelle's car. Her ex-boyfriend Scott told police that Giselle had threatened him and Michelle's life for talking to each other. Even without Michelle's body, the police had enough to charge Giselle Esteban with murder. They believed that Giselle had become so obsessed with the idea of Scott and Michelle being together, it totally consumed and enraged her. She arrived at the hospital that morning claiming she was interested in joining the nursing course. And after being let in by someone, she waited for the secretary to leave before she stole Katie's keycard and the roster telling her where Michelle would be working. She returned that evening and waited for Michelle to head in on her own. She had attacked and killed her in the car park before driving away to dump the car and Michelle's body. Human remains found in a San Francisco Bay Area canyon on Saturday are those of Michelle Lee, the missing nursing student who disappeared in May. Police declined to release any further information, saying only that the remains were identified after tests by the Alameda County coroner. Lee was last seen alive while taking a break during classes at Hayward Hospital May 27th. Earlier this month, Giselle Esteban was arrested and charged with Lee's murder. Police say cell phone signals from both Lee and Esteban had been received from the same area where the remains were found. They believe Esteban attacked Lee in the hospital's parking garage. During a court appearance Monday, Esteban did not enter a plea, but was appointed an attorney. September 10th, 2011, 10 days after Giselle was arrested, 
the police find the skeletal remains of Michelle Lee. Around the body were her white scrubs that she had been wearing the night she vanished. Giselle was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. Scott, who already had 80% custody of their daughter, continued looking after her, and the baby she birthed in prison was given to her parents. Michelle Lee had an enormous impact on everyone she came into contact with. Her friends, family and colleagues are determined that her memory will live on. <laughs>